Hello, and welcome to Planning to Win a Digital Transformation, a webinar provided by Accentium. Accentium is a full service digital agency with service offerings in three main practice areas. Digital, which encompasses digital strategy, user experience, creative design, and digital marketing. Content and commerce, which focuses on the implementation of enterprise content management systems and e-commerce for B2C and B2B commerce. And cloud and CRM, focusing primarily on cloud services on Azure and AWS. Over the past 10 years, Accentium has collaborated with our clients on over 200 digital transformations for organizations of varying sizes and across verticals. No matter the size of the organization, the project, or the budget, every successful digital strategy has one thing in common, which is strong executive sponsorship. Today, we will be sharing some best practices around successful preparation and planning for a digital transformation endeavor. My name is Sam Goble. I am Vice President of Client Services, specializing in digital strategy and personalization. I've worked in the web development space on enterprise delivery for the past 12 years, focusing primarily on digital strategy for the past five years. With me is Dalton Allison, senior digital strategist. Dalton has 14 years of professional experience in various marketing and analytical roles, supporting personalized campaign execution and analytics. He has worked in healthcare, retail, higher education, travel and hospitality, and real estate industries. We're excited to have the time today to share what we have learned collectively over the past several years about the keys to success in digital transformations. What you see here is a high level plan that over the years has worked best for us in delivering digital transformations. Each of the steps or elements is important here, although there are several, several of these areas that we will focus on more heavily today. Before jumping in though, we did want to start by providing this overall picture of how we suggest taking on this type of effort. While Dalton and I could easily go on for hours about the various ingredients of a good digital strategy, we wanted to distill the conversation today down to this topic of executive sponsorship and team building, why it is important, and how as members of the team, you deliver value to continue building upon and earning that executive support. One item that in our experience is non-negotiable is setting and sticking to clear goals for the strategy. Choose two to three goals maximum. By establishing these goals at the outset, expectations across the organization and across teams can be aligned. And by sticking to these goals like a metaphorical lighthouse, it helps keep distractions at bay and focuses on activities that will deliver true business value. When you simplify and focus on those digital goals that will deliver the most value from the very outset, the team can then use those early wins to build momentum with your executive leadership. As that momentum gets built, you can then build upon it further by, by um, get, getting further support and resources because you have delivered that early value. Those that are in charge of managing projects need to project a clear vision of those goals and what it will do for the company, how it will make everyone's job easier, improve customer service, the experience, and ultimately increase sales and conversion. This information should be clear and available to any and everyone involved. Don't treat this as some sort of exclusive country club. Oftentimes we see firms only bringing those with fancy job titles, um, to these conversations while leaving out the ones who actually are responsible for executing and doing the work. It's imperative to bring these people into the conversation early to vet solutions, as well as walk through the detailed processes needed to support whatever you're planning to do. Otherwise, the ones responsible for the dirty work end up working in silos with little context, oftentimes doing their own individual part without really knowing the big picture and not effectively commu communicating and collaborating with other business units on their own. 
whatever the project may be, you should be able to recite to someone in a few short sentences what's going on. This should be clear to those at the top of the food chain as well as those at the bottom. For example, let's say you're a company and implementing a new content management system. It'll be good to have people be able to recite something like, hey, we're implementing a new CMS to organize marketing campaign data, improve workflows, and facilitate reporting. The CMS will also be the foundation to support personalized content based on inbound marketing campaigns, making the marketing department less reliant on IT, speeding up the time it takes to get things into production. Being able to deliver those types of elevator pitches goes a long way in being able to promote and educate others. The big questions around the who, the what, the when, the where, the why should be clear to everyone. There have been times in my personal career where an executive makes a decision without involving the guys who do the work. And it turns out to be a disaster because of his or her limited knowledge around how things work and what the level of effort it is to uh, required to implement and execute. Once people begin to realize their major issues and expectations will not be met, everyone goes into survival mode and things can turn ugly fast. With that said, one thing that is often left out are the finances and how they play a role in some of these decisions. It seems oftentimes that these conversations are held in closed room doors with a select group of executives, which leads to ambiguity to the rest of the team around what the most profitable tactics are or what the financial targets are or how far we are from hitting them. Generally, this exists in larger firms and, you know, and oftentimes you see less financial information is shared down the totem pole. By having an idea of where you need to be from a cost acquisition perspective goes a long way when presenting your ideas and reporting performance. You don't wanna end up spending $200 to sell a $100 product or to acquire a customer with $150 lifetime value. Because I can promise you, if you end up in that situation, don't count on the CFO sending you a Christmas card. No one wants to end up in a situation where they are negatively impacting the finances. You can imagine the political storm that can arise from that. And I think it's safe to say we've all experienced workplace politics and working with people who seem to only be committed if there's something in it for them or something in it to make them and their team look good. Work is so much easier when you're working with people who are willing to commit to the project regardless of the outcome. People who are willing to roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty. Often executives choose people who show the most loyalty or you know, pick the people with the fancy job titles. And many of these projects, when they're set to lead, but at the end of the day, you end up realizing that mainly they're good at delegating. Those responsible for the actual execution, they need to be brought in because those are the ones who are generally familiar with the nuts and bolts of an operation and are better at translating the business requirements into the specific tasks needed to make things work. Most times those responsible for executing, they paint a rosy picture to management because they don't want it to appear as if their job is hard or complicated. They wanna give the impression that things are under control. Leadership may be aware that, hey, we're doing email suppression, but they have no idea of the two dozen steps needed to extract data from the CRM with an API, merge it with transactional data, build the suppression logic, gather the digital assets, loading whatever data you need into your email client, then the following QA and testing processes needed to ensure that the consumers are receiving the proper content in the email. That's the difference between the doers and the delegators. If there are only delegators in the room, no work will get done. Tasks will need to be passed down the food chain, often resulting in things getting lost in translation and context and details are being left out. The doers are given very little information and end up working in silos, which can greatly impact the quality and the speed of the work that actually has to get done. In these situations, it really helps to have good project managers who are experienced in collaboration and communicating what needs to be done and who will actually do the work. Dalton, that's a really good point. Um, and you know, when we talk about navigating the relationship between the delegators who are very necessary and the doers, we do need to talk about that project management role. And so it's important when putting your team together for digital transformation that you not only include the right roles, but also the right skill sets needed. 
And so what I mean by this is we shouldn't just consider someone's job title alone when you're determining the makeup of that team. You should also be discussing ahead of time and have a clear understanding of what each person does as well as how they do it. This becomes even more critical in situations where we have teams either entirely or partially remote, which is, which is a reality for most folks these days. And if you can't regularly get people in the same room, you need to make sure that there is cohesion around how each group um, of the delivery team, how, how their work comes together for that transformation project as a whole. Key to this is something that I want to focus on um, is one of the roles that can really make or break the success of your strategy, and that's the project manager. I come from a digital project or from a project management background, but entirely in the consulting space. And one of the things that I've learned is that the duties and expectations of someone whose title is project manager are not always the same depending on the organization or the project type. So for example, sometimes the expectation of a project manager is primarily administrative. They're responsible for managing and scheduling meetings. They might coordinate agile ceremonies, and they might also report on the status of tasks, budget, et cetera. When I use the term project manager, it's possible that in your organization, this role could be referred to as a program manager, a product owner, a marketing or IT director. And so I want to be clear that the role I'm referring to is the person who works across the different teams um, or silos, you know, the different groups of workers and drives the transformation project from a day to day tactical perspective. When we have transformation projects that run smoothly and successfully, they always have a person in this role who at the very least at a high level number one truly understands the overall goals of the project. This person is a critical thinker and a problem solver. Um, so they know what questions to ask of team members and they know how to dig in with each of those team members or groups to understand potential risks as well as to help find opportunities for efficiencies and problem solving. They should very closely manage the process and know how to adapt and guide the team toward improving. Um, so in other words, they should be forward thinking and not just looking at the current work, but really understanding how all of it comes together um, to deliver that, that effective project in the end. This person is also a very proactive communicator. They own the vision for the execution of the work. So the timeline, the milestones, and how all of those things fit together to meet the goals of, of the transformation. They should also be leading that team, helping to keep them on track by keeping the focus on the strategic objectives. So they should have the capability to help facilitate communication around things that could be scope creep or could be risks or distractions. So they're really kind of driving that, driving that project, keeping it on track. This person also needs to be able to provide stakeholders or executive sponsors at any point in time with an overview of the status of the work. And this means they need to understand it. So they may not be an analyst, they may not be a developer, but they do need to be able to provide that overview to somebody else outside of the project who's not in the day to day and give them the confidence and be able to answer some, you know, some kind of basic questions about where the work is and how it's going. So long and short of it is they're not just a taskmaster. And it's true, part of the role is to maintain schedules, organize meetings and help remove blockers, but they should really own the project, especially the overall day to day. And to do this effectively, I'll, I'll reiterate, they need to have an understanding of the vision of the transformation and how it's going to come together. And so when you have a person like this at the helm of a digital transformation effort, what is also happening is you're empowering the rest of the team to do what they do best. Because having this strong day-to-day -day leadership lets them simply focus on their area. Um, so you're getting the best out of people and you're helping to kind of minimize distraction, noise, and worry, and you're maximizing that value that you're getting from each of those team members. 
Additionally, when that happens, you're also increasing the confidence that the stakeholders and that the executive sponsorship has in the group overall. And to add on to that, one thing that firms with great project management do is they do a really great job at managing the expectations and conflicts between different business units. Sometimes we can probably replace the word business units with people. However, we're not going to get into all of that right now. But the point I want to make is that in every project there will be, and I don't want to use the term winners and losers, but let's say there are groups and business units who will benefit and get more exposure and those who won't. And if you're going to have to deal with pushback internally, it will most likely originate from the latter. Maybe it won't be as blatant as someone openly denouncing or objecting to things. It is often passive aggressive and may manifest as anything as simple as a, as a lack of communication and cooperation, delayed responses to inquiries, or it could just be outright attempts at derailing the project. A good way to get ahead of this and combat that is by developing a culture and processes where each business unit can make the case for what they need and want. And those things get a fair evaluation and placed on a roadmap for everyone to see. And this roadmap I'm speaking of may not guarantee everything on it will get done or, or resources are actively being devoted to it, but consider it a mix of everything from things that are in a, an idea and suggestion phase to things that are actually in flight. And having a roadmap where other business units can see their own projects and enhancements down the road gives executives a clear picture of how things are being prioritized, their dependencies, and how things build upon and enable each other. For example, first we're going to upgrade our CRM, then we're going to implement processes to expose our CRM data to our digital properties, then we're going to implement retargeting personalized content based on transaction history. A good roadmap will communicate that progression across the firm. In our own research, and I believe we recently asked this question on social media, poor planning and communication was listed as the number one reason companies fail to adopt and adapt to new technologies. It wasn't a lack of skill. It wasn't poor execution. Communication and poor planning was the number one reason. So having the type of culture that brings everything out into the open makes it easier for, communi uh, for, for communication and makes it easier for executives to sponsor and support initiatives. This type of roadmap planning will answer a lot of questions and alleviate a lot of the concerns around whether those managing the projects have the quote unquote big picture in mind. And another good benefit is that this type of setup also allows you to break things down into small digestible chunks and it makes it easier to avoid biting off more than you can chew risking failure and then lose support for future projects yeah those are good points dalton and to build on this idea of creating a culture to support ongoing digital efforts i'm going to talk for a bit about the importance of setting up that cadence for ongoing stakeholder and executive communication so it might seem a little silly to bring up and a no-brainer to make that statement but it's very easy when you're in the midst of the ongoing work to get a digital transformation project off the ground to keep moving along without reiterating those goals and objectives as you go. And this happens because the delivery team is very focused on the day to day. They know what the goals and objectives are because they're really living that. But the stakeholders outside of the project aren't necessarily seeing those efforts day to day. And so it benefits you to, um, to make sure that along the way, the why we're doing this gets reiterated. We talked a lot at the beginning about how the business objectives and marketing goals really need to be agreed upon across business units. What I've seen though is that once that project gets started, new requests and questions start flowing in. Um, the outside teams get excited that this project is happening and so they're bringing new ideas to you constantly. And this has the risk of distracting the team from the work at hand. Now, most of these requests are well-intentioned. It's coming from an excitement and a buy-in from the organization about why this work is important. But having strong executive sponsorship as well as a strong project manager will allow for those requests to be heard and recorded and will allow for per periodic evaluation and triaging. We advise our clients in these situations to keep their eyes on that medical, metaphorical lighthouse that I mentioned earlier. 
if a new request is a distraction and doesn't fit with the goals and objectives, then that request simply gets added to the backlog for consideration later. If it aligns with the goals, but it expands the scope and level of effort of the project, we can sometimes add it in, but usually caution against that, especially at the beginning. <laughs> scope creep is very real in these situations. And so what we often advise is to focus on a more modest initial scope because you risk the work dragging on. And the longer you delay your chance to deliver that business value, the more you risk gaining the confidence of your organization in your work. So to help with these conversations, I do have a few tips. Um, when this process works well, there's usually a format that is standard for new functionality requests. Um, it includes answers to the questions of what is the business case? What is the reason for asking um, for this additional functionality? What is the functional request? So understanding exactly what is, um, what is desired. What is the potential business value? So what problem or concern will it help solve? And then finally, how will it be measured? Um, and this, this, I've, this process that I just described has been especially helpful in transformation projects where I've seen requests for sort of random A-B testing or putting in a personalization scenario where the business case is usually, well, I'm just curious about this. <laughs> Make sure that we're focusing on a goal, object, an objective, business value, as well as measurement, which, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, when interacting with um, stakeholders or other business units who have new requests while a project is in flight, regularly refer to what those agreed upon business objectives and goals were that your organization agreed to at the outset. And then finally on this topic, make sure, and I cannot stress this enough, focus on what you can confidently deliver and measure. So as an example, um, in the past, I've had projects where the main goal was to provide better user experience. And so years ago, this would often be communicated as, you know, the goal is to have better UX so that our website doesn't look as antiquated and will be easier to navigate. So that seems like a really great goal on the surface of it. And sometimes that is totally obvious that yes, we're gonna build a new website, for example, or build out a new section or experience um, of our digital offering, and that's going to make things better. I would see organizations skip the step to identify KPIs and performance metric goals. So early on, this may seem fine and, and the organization may say, this is fine, you know, I, I, we're not really worried about KPIs. But Dalton and I are here to tell you that we promise that six months or a year down the road after you deliver, someone in the organization is going to ask, well, what did we get for that X number of dollars investment, right? Show me what I got for it. And simply pointing at um, you know, a new look and feel isn't really gonna get you there. You have to be able to prove out that business value. So make sure when you're asked to add something to the scope of your work that you understand how its success will be measured. And if the requester can't tell you, the digital transformation team should be proposing how it will be measured. And so I can't emphasize the, uh, enough the importance of having that plan as to how you're going to measure performance and communicate that out to the team so that you don't have surprises in that area down the road. Now, I've spent a lot of my time as an analyst, so a lot of what Sam just mentioned hits very close to home. And I can tell you one thing is that no one can see into the future and predict or forecast every positive and negative thing that will undoubtedly appear. Because I can tell you right now, if that were the case, every one of your analysts would quit their jobs and make millions of dollars trading stocks. But with that said, it's important as leaders to refer to past projects in ways that make your employees want to contribute. How often do you hear of people refer to past projects in negative ways and focus on all the little things that were overlooked, the unintended consequences, or how hard it was to deal with all the conflicts? It's common to hear people badmouth or you know, talk negatively about the other business units or the ones who took part in the project. You know, this person did not plan for this, or these guys left that out, or they ended up breaking this and so on and so forth. 
As leaders in your company vent their frustrations, usually to the staff that reports directly to them, when the time arises in the future for them to be a part of the next big project, how do you think they would feel? You know, put yourself in their shoes. If that's how the previous projects and those that took part in the projects are discussed, how eager do you think others will be when it's their time to embark on a new project? No one wants to be committed to something when they know their efforts are going to be criticized. The point I'm trying to make is how you approach and deal with these unknowns and unplanned outcomes will make a huge difference, not only in worker morale and getting people to be on board, but how you discuss and present shortcomings to executives give the impression that you have everything under control. This is not about ignoring or admitting things. This is more about the language and tone of how things are discussed. You should be able to present these things as learnings and opportunities for optimization rather than negative shortcomings. Beyond how these things are discussed is the importance of emphasizing a process and processes that allow for improvement and optimization. Some may feel that once they flip the switch, engagement, conversions, average order value, transactions, revenue, or whatever KPI you have or you're measuring will immediately improve. The reality is that it takes time to get into a rhythm where you know how to use the tools and put workflows and processes in place. When the light turns green, there should be steps in place to iteratively execute increasingly complex tasks while taking learnings from each iteration. Finding the right content, call to actions, design, digital assets, and cadence for a marketing campaign takes time. In addition, don't forget about the customer and their experience. If you're going through a website redesign and all of a sudden a visitor is now given a brand new experience and flow that they've never seen before, it's gonna take time for them to adjust and react. And as you imagine, customers will always, always interact with your product or move around your website in ways that you never imagined. So there needs to be time and processes in place to recognize document and make necessary adjustments. And speaking of testing, take it slow. And the best piece of advice I can give you is to test as few things as you can at a time. Too many variables will muddy the data and lead to bad or um, inconclusive results. You don't want to implement too many distractions or inadvertently create conflicts and obstacles to conversion. You wanna make sure your measurements are clean and represent a clear picture of performance. So when executives ask for performance, you wanna have the ability to show results, whether they're good or bad, and also have a plan of action going forward. Once you have completed that successful digital transformation project and you've gone through you know, your, your first rollout, it's really critical to make sure that you build upon the momentum that you've built up um, and that you don't, you know, stop too long to take a breath and rest after that big initial effort. So make sure that as you go, you're developing a plan for what comes next to help build upon that momentum. As part of this, make sure that you don't underestimate or undervalue the importance of creating that good process. When you have a really good transparent process in place to gather and evaluate requests, communicate out appropriately and proactively, use your subject matter experts to their fullest potential. All of these things will start to work very smoothly and they'll continue to improve the work quality. It's also gonna support your team so that they're in a position to be motivated and excel and advance their skills and knowledge. So all of that said, um, I'm gonna wrap up with a few thoughts here. What if you don't have a plan yet? So what if you've, you've dropped into this webinar to learn a little bit because you, you don't have this plan for what your organization is going to do for potentially an overdue digital transformation? If you don't yet have a plan, my strong recommendation to you is to make sure that your organization has a point of view on the subject. So think about how this would be defined for your company because of course every organization is unique. But think about how a, a transformation or at least a point of view on the subject um, can, can be thought about in terms of how it can be used to deliver business value. 
Other overall advice that I have um, from dealing with many different types of clients is to make sure, yes, you should have an eye on your competition, but start first with what you know about your own organization. Excel in your lane first so that you're in the best um, position to take on and overtake that competition. I'm also here to tell you that there is business value that you can deliver even with a modest budget or a small team. Um, I think a lot of us attend you know, different webinars and, and we sit through case studies where we see what the best of the best are doing in this area and what the most advanced folks are doing. And typically they have very, very large budgets. So it's easy for a smaller organization to say, well, we're not that large global organization. So that's why we can't do what they're doing. You can make an impact with, a, like I said, with that smaller budget or that smaller team, but it's critical that you take those initial steps. So ignoring or postponing a potential digital transformation is not going to make the need for it to go away. So what I'd suggest to you is to think about what you can do with what you currently have. You may not have as many critical blockers as you think if you distill a digital transformation project down to focusing on delivering a couple of key goals, things that will add the most value to your organization. I've had a lot of conversations in which folks think that personalization, for example, is a no-go because the idea is that it requires a huge budget or a huge team. And in most of those cases, that assumption is focused on the limitations you may have rather than how to scale that strategy appropriately. So for example, you could focus on one key conversion that you might have on your website, whereby improving on that single conversion point could deliver a huge impact and a huge business value. And so if you put your eggs kind of in that in a, in a single basket like that, knowing that that's really key to your business, that could be a really good way to start. And then you can scale your efforts um, from there moving forward. So I did, wanna, I did wanna leave us off today with at least that encouragement at the end that personalization and digital transformation is not only to the largest organizations with a huge MarTech stack and a huge budget. It really is for everyone and can be scaled appropriately. So to wrap up, Dalton and I do wanna thank you for your time today. And we welcome any further questions that you may have. We're always happy to discuss this topic with folks, especially to learn more about the work you're doing around your digital transformations and any challenges that you may be facing. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can contact us through the Accentium website at accentium.com.